for this kind of invitation to this relevant uh, webinar seminar. Unfortunately, the pandemic is forcing us to a, <laughs> to a far presentation. It would be lovely to be in person and visiting your, your beautiful surroundings and, and Singleton. But anyway, um, I'm here today to introduce, like, to, to talk about playing with coherence in soft XA scattering as we do at uh, NSF NSLS2 on the beam line. I represent the coherent soft XA scattering beam and CSX 23AD1. And I hope that I will bring you around with a, a little bit of a microspectral diffractive journey <laughs> around some, some electrons in correlated materials as a subtitle, exactly for the reason you said. So the outline of my seminar is very simple, just uh, some scientific interest and the uh, and the need for advanced tools, in particular soft, soft resonant elastic XA scattering and the addition of coherence. So some cases brought out of the beamline. So what, we, what can we do, what can we learn? And in the meantime, we can get some new perspectives uh, also because new tools have been developed as a result of our interest and in scientific investigation. And then we conclude quickly with uh, challenges, opportunities, opportunities and caveats somehow and the wish list of things that we would love to see realized in, in the hopefully near future. So first of all, I would like to uh, acknowledge the many people that collaborated or are collaborating with us at various levels. First of all, the Beamline team. So Andy, Wen, Stuart, and not attached to the Beamline, but to the Synchrotron Oleg, whose uh, software helped us from source to simulation of the experiment and being able to propagate the full wavefront down to the sample and to the detector. So it's extremely powerful. And then the internal and external collaborators that we have. So I put in laser pointer so that it's easier for you to see my mouse. <clears throat> so first of all, internal to BNL condensed matter physics and material um, science department with uh, Mark, John and Ian and the many uh, postdocs that have and are working with them. So Xiao, Vivek, uh, uh, Yao and, uh, and uh, Miao. And then the external to our, to our lab uh, at MIT, Ricardo Comin and Jeffrey Beach Group and the various uh, young people are active that in, uh, produce a beautiful, beautiful uh, investigation of various materials we will see uh, during the seminar. And uh, in Rutgers University, Valerie Kiryukin's group we are actively collaborating with. And then across the ocean, our, our friends and uh, collaborators in Germany, MBI and TU Berlin. So what accumulates all these people is the interest indeed in electronic behavior, in uh, uh, condensed matter physics, and in particular in strongly correlated electron system at various levels. And here we come with some, let's say, general scientific motivation of why. I think that even for for most of the people around, I do not need to, to say anything, but just to be sure that we develop a common language somehow. I, I put a, a general introductory slide on the on the on a little bit of an overview of the science. Essentially, we want to span and understand what's happening from nanoscale to macroscale and define what mesoscale is and how to deal with it. There are essentially enormous opportunities there. So we need obviously <clears throat> to span across various uh, orders of magnitude in size, uh, so space and time essentially, and to try to understand uh, what the phenomena that we see are and how to exploit them eventually, if we can. Some of them are quantum phenomena that can emerge up to our landscape at the limit, right? So up to our macro scales. And sometimes because of their characteristics, sometimes because we have some uh, protections in terms of topology, phase coherence or whatever, and so we all know, and it was beautifully uh, summarized in this uh, famous article by Tokura, how the, uh, the history went and where we are and where we want to go. And in this perspective is essentially, I will start with the, the famous case of high temperature superconductors and in particular, mostly for historical reason, we have a fantastic um, group uh, in condensed matter physics in particular for growing samples and applying many, uh, many uh, different uh, scientific investigation techniques on these samples. And so <clears throat> it is a, it is a well-known evolution of the uh, critical uh, superconductive temperature versus years. And that's the, oh, sorry. And that's the part that pertains to the big jump induced mid eighties 
by the discovery of the cuprates and their uh, strongly correlated, let's say, uh, contribution to superconductivity. So uh, out of a, of a number of uh, structures that are known, available, the common theme is the copper or copper oxide uh, plane and the fact that they have similar phase diagram and sometimes even peculiarities in the phase diagram as at specific dopings, for example, there is a suppression of the superconductivity that is well known and we will analyze a little better because we gave a direct contribution on this. So the crucial point here is to understand why the electrons do what they do and so which is the mechan mechanism underneath, which is still a matter of, of uh, hot discussion uh, between uh, uh, lattice coupling, other mechanisms involving electronic degrees of freedom, and so on and so forth. We will clearly not set a final reply on anything, but I would love to, to show you that a small contribution that we, that we, were, we think we were able to give and, uh, uh, in, this, in, this, uh, let's say in this line. So obviously to <clears throat> investigate such a fine uh, level of uh, contribution to electrons, specific electrons in a material, right? Leaving some specific characteristics, but out of the many available, only few of them essentially are the one contributing, and maybe talking to the others, and we have to discover if and how. We need something that is uh, an advanced technique with uh, capabilities from of spanning in time and space over orders of magnitude, with the aim of specific uh, charge and uh, and. Uh, and chemical specific, specific information from our materials. And so we, we decided to go from to, to extra scattering because it's well known that in the atomic scattering factors, everything, let's say at the microscopic level, realize we have chemical sensitivity, we can have site sensitivity. It's certainly a very photonangle technique because it competes with other uh, prevalent, uh, uh, let's say, phenomena, at least in the energy scales where we want to, to see if we use soft but essentially over all the spectrum available at, at uh, synchrotrons. So there's no way that it's a prevalent factor, of course. However, it's enough to, to extract quite a bit of information as we will prove. And this is uh, one, one of the cases uh, taken as an example, but it's pretty much uh, identical to everything. It's the case of iron. So you see very much that already into the photon, just using photons, scattering is certainly all the so magnitude smaller than other <clears throat> Another phenomena as it's brought here on this logarithmic scale log log plot of uh, uh, absorption and scattering cross sections versus photon energy. However, the ZOP, eh? and uh, in particular, what we want to do is to use a photon in photon out technique that relies on the photopromotion of a core electron to inspect empty states above Fermi energy and where the information on what is experienced by this electron projecting its own state on the available state during this virtual process is encoded in information that is retrieved out of the emitted photons, depending on its intensity, momentum, and polarization, even that we want to deal with scattering and diffraction in particular. So in general, staying in the elastic regime, let me say, <clears throat> the, the energy of the incoming and the outcoming photon have to be considered identical. And we will see that this is a, a little bit of, a, of, of an issue sometimes. So in general, <clears throat> it's just the only two, essentially two uh, equations that I have in my talk, but just to say that we measure an intensity of the detector that writes exactly identical as you are used to in standard diffraction, except that now the atomic scattering factor is not only depending on the modulus of Q, but in, being, um, given this process that is projecting some wave function or other wave function being intrinsically tensorial, you depend on the incoming and outcoming uh, wave vector of the light and their polarization. Second order perturbation theory helps us in, in understanding how to do it. And essentially, as you can imagine, it's a, it's a standard Heisenberg uh, 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 formula where out of a, of a, of a divergent uh, denominator, resonant denominator, kept under control only by the lifetime of the, of the corolla, you take a certain status, let's suppose that it's the ground state, you project with an, with an operator into an, an excited state, and you photo project back into a finite state that if you are discussing about something elastic, is supposed to be identical to the starting one. In reality, this is not necessarily the case, right? Quantum mechanics tell us that everything can happen with certain probability, maybe zero, but 
in principle certain probabilities. So what you get out in reality in terms of energy loss out of your sample when you, when you impinge with, uh, with photons is, apart from electrons and other things that we are not considering, a bunch of photons and some of them have lost energies because they uh, talk with uh, uh, available degrees of freedom into matter and this is per pertinence of inelastic um, techniques. Instead, we are only dealing with the elastic part, the one that comes out exactly the same energy or very, very close to the impinging photons. The problem is that <clears throat> it's sometimes difficult to separate this part out of everything else. If you're lucky, it's just the background, everything else, and the, the, the variance of this, of this signal across the reciprocal lattice, due to the fact that it replies to Bragg, it's enough to separate out what is elastic to what it is not, but it's not always the case, especially if you're dealing with signals that are poorly correlated and weak. And so sometimes this poses problems. We will see some across the top. So why, or what can we do if we add coherence to the game? And we can do quite a lot. So what, what is coherence? Let me, let me try to, <clears throat> to say a word, not because it's probably necessary in this environment, given that it's a series of seminars on coherence, but just to, as I said, to put everybody at the same page for what I will use later in the talk. So please bear with me if, if, if it is not really <clears throat> very, very precise, the formulation, but just to give an idea. And it's essentially what is necessary to understand everything else that comes later. So if you have a, somehow a poor control of your wavefront, where you can control only the average distance between uh, the, the, the waves, uh, let's say, right, in your, in your train that is impinging on an idealized sample here described by Van der Den in these beautiful pictures uh, quite, a bit, quite a bit ago by now. So let's say a collection of, for example, powders, whatever you want, right, in general, scattering points in your samples. As I was saying, if you have only a poor control of the wavefront and the average parameter lambda, so the wavelength, is the only thing that you really, on average, can control, we know perfectly what the result of the experiment is. It's a diffuse ring that is <clears throat> nothing else than powder, powder diffraction. And the geometrical relevant parameter you can, you can detect, you can measure on your detector, is essentially related with the characteristics of the light and the intrinsic lattice spacing that is characterizing the average description of your sample, right? Very important, as we all know. And it's giving a first-hand microscopic information out of your sample. Really, really, really relevant because it, it can build up the, the average structure of your sample indeed. But if you do better, and if you're able to control, have full control of your wavefront, where here is the, at the limit, the idealized case of a, of a perfect plane wave, but it's much less what is needed. And we will see it a little bit later, how to relax, what happens if you relax this condition under certain, and anyway, certain condition, not completely. And so you have a, a waveform control. That means K depends only slightly on position in a certain way. Then you can get much more on your detector. You can, uh, somehow you get in focus, let's say, with your, with your, within your diffraction ring. And you see a structure that are uh, intensity fluctuations, local intensity fluctuation of pixel by pixel appear. And if the illumination function is small enough such that this distance between, uh, uh, between uh, variation, peak and valleys, that are called speckled indeed, and constitute the difference of which constitutes the contrast of the speckled pattern that is uh, appearing on the detector is suitable, then you can get essentially a Fourier transform information on the distribution of, of scattering centers into your, into your sun. So that opens up a lot more information available in your experiments. And this comes obviously with some caveats because anything that perturbs this, uh, this situation may hinder your results. It's not only on the wavefront, but it's mostly on the reciprocal positioning, let's say, of the wavefront, the sample, and the detector. And any kind of Ah, here we are. And any kind of motion that you would induce, for example, an, an inadverted motion of the sample, will give you back in the previous in the previous condition of a diffuse ring under certain under center conditions. So we have to be attentive. The other question that uh, obviously arises is: Are we able to produce those kind of wavefronts? Are we able to control the wavefronts as, as as it should as it should be needed for getting? The, the useful information out of the sample we want. But yes, we can. In reality, any source is just an overlap of incoherent photons in terms of energy and even the, even the characteristics of the, of the propagation of the light is just a matter of, uh, an over, uh, can be described as an overlap of uh, uh, different energies and different uh, direction of propagation of light, right? So it is sufficient to <clears throat> essentially constrain the spatial coherence by, by uh, collimation 
and then filter to, to discriminate the energy, the energies to obtain exactly what we need. The problem is how many photons are left, right? Because one photon is perfectly coherent, not very useful, unfortunately, or not always useful, let's say, per se. So the treatment is, uh, in reality, is quite uh, simple. It uh, relies completely on the ondulatory part of the light. And uh, uh, due, as I say, to the nature of the light itself, you have, it's, it's natural to, 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 to split the problem into and project in the two relevant uh, directions, the one of propagation of light and the one transversal, for which we have time or longitudinal, which is related, obviously, to the uh, monochromatic, monochromatic characteristics of the device you have. This is, for example, the, um, the expression in terms of um, the resolving power of a monochromator or equivalent device. And then you have the space or, tra or um, transverse uh, coherence length that is essentially a purely geometric characteristics, the solid angle under, under which you look at the source or equivalent. Let me say that both of them, as you see, depend linearly on lambda once those two parameters are singled out. And you can think that under reasonable condition over an, a relatively extended area of energies or lambdas, as you want, this, this, uh, this um, parameter is, is essentially constant, as it is typically the case. So both of them are essentially linear, linear in lambda. And this has important consequences that we will see in a second. Indeed, why do we want to go soft? We all know that given the expression we gave before for the intensity of the detector, oops, um, we, we, we are expecting to pay an enormous price in terms of, um, in terms of uh, even sphere, right? Again, using the iron as we did before as a case, if you move in resonance from K edges that are here, right, around seven kilo electron volt to L edges that are one order of magnitude smaller in terms of energies, as it's typically the case, the jump for uh, transition methods. Um, and you go to the L3 at 700 electron volt. You see that a typical structure that can be a roughly a pair of skies, right, or whatever, uh, that you can have changes dramatically from the point of view of diffraction. In one of the cases, you, you populate the allowed umbrella, uh, evil umbrella with many points that are reachable, and so you can perform experiments. Many times, you simply can't in soft X-rays. So is this worth then the case? Hmm. There are two considerations that should be done from the tech, purely technical point of view, one of which is, the fact of having several diffraction points is not always the, is not always an advantage. For example, it constrains you to limitation due to multiple scattering, which is certainly not a problem in soft X-rays. The other is that yes, you cannot study the structure or not directly, maybe, but you can you can study any kind of order that is actually uh, let's say susceptible to frustration, and as such, as typically a propagation vector that is large, but smaller, so it's a structure that is larger in the real space. And this is exactly what typically happens, luckily, to electrons in complex systems, right? Where complexity is one and frustration is one of the points. Certainly, you will have some propagation vector, or very, very likely, you have some propagation vector that sits in the surrounding of the zero propagation vector itself. So it can maybe, maybe study, luckily, by soft X-rays. And this is exactly what we are interested in. The other advantage is what we already shown before. Apart from the fact that the scattering is much smaller than the absorption and other uh, cross section as I, as I was trying to show before. The, the difference between the K resonances and the L resonances for transition method is massive. It's at least one order of magnitude or more. So there's obviously an advantage in terms of the strength of the signal and other characteristics that I will, see, I will show in a moment for move, to move to soft. Indeed, so why coherence and why soft? But, or better, why soft? <clears throat> but let's, let's recap. So in terms of scientific motivation, there is a, a relevance in the target electrons that we are aiming at. L edges for transition metal are the way in which you would like to tune to electrons that are actually bringing the, the information out of the electronic uh, order correlation and so on and so forth that develops in, 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 in relevant cases. And the other is that luckily, for the same reason, if you take uh, uh, most of the, of the cases of uh, of interesting, uh, of interesting available materials in nature. Now, here there is a depict, uh, we depict some cases as taken from uh, one of the group in Harvard University through STM images. You will see that there is any kind of, uh, of uh, rearrangement in homogeneities and so propagation vector potentially if, uh, if the structures are, are regular that are present. And so we have a plethora of, of cases that are both and very interesting to be studied indeed. So, right? And so in homogeneities and textures in particular, are even relevant per se. And again, so the coherence will, be, will play a major role. And technologically, 
there is another good reason because it's difficult to produce, as we said, a lot of coherence or better, a high coherent flux, let's say, so to have good coherence and good intensity at the sample. And so in soft, uh, one of the, one of the uh, key parameters that plays is exactly the longitudinal part, right? We, we, we can relax a lot the longitudinal requests in terms of uh, coherence length because the penetration depth into material is anyway very small. And so <clears throat> even if, even if you, we, we do not monochromatize too much our radiation, it would be sufficient from the coherence point of view to form beautiful speckles, long story short. This means that soft by chance, essential for the, the average density of the materials available and so on and so forth, it falls in the, in the happy spot between being strongly interacting enough to bring information out of, uh, very strong information out of materials, let's compare to, to Newton's, for example, which is the opposite extreme if possible, and not, not interacting strong enough not to be confined only on the top layer of materials, but being bulk somehow enough such that oxidation properties or are happening at the surface can impact on the signal, but not necessarily and not too much. So we are just in an episode. Ideal to study, for example, barrier interfaces. So as we, as we heard yesterday, beautiful talk by uh, Harald Reicher from uh, the SRF, the director, one of the directors of the SRF. In the mature uh, third generation synchrotron sources, as he called our, our, uh, our synchrotrons, very quirky. The limit, given the, the intrinsic anisotropy of the electron beam that is uh, populating our machines, the coherence is essentially limited by the horizontal emittance, right? And so there's a plot of, uh, of uh, the relevant energies in our case and the photon limit, uh, the so-called diffraction limit sources, right, as they go um, in terms of horizontal emittance. And we see very clearly where we sit, our beautiful source, uh, perfectly tuned for soft X-rays is sitting where your, your, your source guys sit, which is better than ours, uh, having come slightly later. And where in the future we think also other new fourth generation in the soft <coughs> sources are supposed to come. So we are, we are essentially going better and better in covering the crucial, point, the crucial part of the spectrum that in our case is essentially sitting here between 500 and 1000 electron volts. We, we, we spend 90 something percent of our time, although our beam line can go from 250 carbon to 2000 electron volt, essentially, most of our experiments are, are performed in this area. So we are not perfectly coherent as our horizontal, we, we start to get modes from 400 electron volt, 350 electron volts upwards, but we still have a relevant fraction, a coherent fraction in our beam, and I will show better numbers later, just to give you an idea of where we are and what we, we can perform and where we potentially want to go, who can go already in other sources. So how does the, our look, our floor looks like, just to give you an idea. So <clears throat> uh, we are a 23 AD uh, beam port and in reality we are two beam lines. That that's the reason why CSX is called 23 AD one, because we have a sister beam line number two, which is inboard compared to us. And it's called the IOS in operandus spectroscopy. So we cannot be more different as beamlands, right? They are chemistry, uh, spectroscopy, catalysis oriented, and we are hard condensed, diffraction, coherent uh, beamlands. So really, really, really different. For historical reason, the two beamlands were canted, but only of a very, very small amount. And so although they, they are supposed to be completely, um, let's say, independent, because they are, uh, there are two independent TPUs that are providing light to the two sources, in reality, we have problems of crosstalk. And so we can effectively only operate 50% of the time controlling our, the energy of the photons that are descending our beam line. So long story short, this is a cartoon picture of, the, of, the, of our beam line. The EPU obviously, sorry, is sitting way upstream here out of the, of the picture on the right. And we have a first mirror and then a monochromator, second mirror that is the only uh, horizontal focusing element of the beam line, well, obviously the VLS low at the monochromator provides the vertical focusing before uh, shining light into the uh, optical aperture that is sitting uh, roughly 50 meters downstream the, the source. This is largely sufficient and that's the reason why it's so simple the design to preserve uh, the coherence as much as possible and to propagate a, a lot of photons as I said our, our resolution function of the uh, better, our resolving power of the monochromator is in reality quite limited. We typically live between 1000 and 2000, probably closer to 1000 and 2000 for most of the energy range of interest, but it's exactly matched for what we need to do as I will, I will uh, detail later. So, 
uh, we shine light into our end station, which is shown here as a large vessel in vacuum, ultra vacuum, obviously, for, for reasons related with the techniques we use. And uh, it hosts uh, either only a pin or a coupled zone plate and OSA on a reduced uh, diffractometer we are schematized very basically like a one degree of freedom, rotation degree of freedom, and a detector that goes around uh, covering essentially two pi of space, right? And it's a fast CCD detector developed uh, together with uh, Berkeley, in a collaboration with Berkeley, let's say, and that uh, provides very good, very good results. And we have also another station uh, at the end of the beam line here that I may, may have time to, to talk about a little bit. So let's jump back to science and try to, to, to find the drive for where we want to, to land finally. Right, you, may, you may remember that quite a while ago, uh, John Tranquilla came out of the PNL and I came up with a very nice uh, model, electronic model, microscopic model, to explain the, the, uh, the scientific information that was uh, in his end at that moment. So it was known that the superconductive dome of the 214 family of cuprates, it was not exactly that one, the uh, sample study, but it is irrelevant, it's the same family. So this, the, I was always saying the superconductive dome <coughs> here depicted versus doping had a depression in uh, exactly 1.8 doping. And it was not clear why this was happening. Uh, by Newton's neutron experiment, he measured uh, uh, what, what it looked to his eyes as an intertwined periodic order, characterized by a different propagation vector of a factor of two between charge and, mag and magnetism, and a, and a, a temperature evolution that was clearly uh, getting together with the structural information he had already available or in its end. An explanation all in one shot of microscopic and macroscopic properties on the system if electrons were thought to uh, condense in an order that was at the same time having a charge and the spin part intertwined together on the copper oxide plane, as I said, name stripes. So obviously the neutron is only indirectly sensitive to charge and directly sensitive to magnetism. And so for a long time, it was difficult to uh, see if this order was only related with the specific family, or it was explaining other properties that were similar or seen similarly in other families of the cuprates. And I had, the, I had the luck of passing uh, through Milano University when uh, the data of uh, out of resonant inelastic X ray scattering and softer gene were available, and we were able to explain that at least one of the families was behaving exactly the same. And we were, in this case, sensitive to the charge part through X rays, and, uh, and we, we could prove that that was the case in the YBCO family indeed. Since a lot of effort has been put with many techniques, most of them soft, by the way. To prove that actually this is an ubiquitous uh, property, so charge, at least the charge part, because now we are more sensitive to charge and, uh, than to magnetism, of course, but at least the charge part behaves, it's, it's, it's ubiquitous to, to all these kind of problems, and various families behave in, in, equivalent, in an equivalent way, and although there are important differences in how, for example, the wave vector, that's where the propagation vector goes versus stopping, that still has to be resolved. And this is not, obviously, not, not so uh, impressive, or better, not so surprising, let me say, because the differences in the structure are massive. And so it's actually surprising that <laughs> charge density wave is, is so common to, ever, to, to, to all, all the structures. And so, long story short, there are a number of, uh, of uh, questions that are still open and we need to understand. So what is the relation with the crystallographic structure? What is the relation to superconductivity and the role of domains? And also, to try to understand why they look so different sometimes. So we have very strong correlated, strong signal, or very broad uncorrelating the weak signal, depending on which or which of these families is indeed looked at. And this one is one, one of the reasons why it took so long actually to discover that there is a certain kind of similarities in all, the, in all those structures. So having a coherent uh, beam, we started easy. We, want, we went for uh, uh, looking at LPCO in, uh, in the magic composition of 1.8, put the sound, put the, the diffractometer on the, on the suitable uh, propagation vector and got a beautiful signal full of speckles. So now we see very well out of our detector, this is a region on, on our detector extracted as a, crude, as a crude image, maybe correctly for background or anything else. So you see very well that uh, in first approximation we have a, a kind of Gaussian envelope, but the intensity is all um, modulated essentially pixel by pixel. If we make a longitudinal cut as depicted here by the dashed line, 
you will see that over a background that you're always fighting against because fluorescence, for example, is, is, is around everywhere, plus in elastic in general, and so on and so forth, as we saw before. We have indeed a Gaussian kind of um, peak and then oscillation due to the speckles that are forming. If you take only the smoothed peak, so the average description, or if you prefer, if you integrate the whole area of the detector, you forget about speckles, and you change the temperature, you see clearly that the order parameter goes as expected and reported with other techniques, the full width of maximum as well. So, ah, by the way, sorry, I forgot to say that in this specific experiment performed a copper L3, obviously, with a standard, our standard 10 micron Pino spatial filter in front of the, of the sample, we get longitudinal and transversal um, coherence lengths that are exceeding what we need. And still we have a 10 to the 13 photons per second on the sample of coherent flux, right? And this is what is needed for achieving these results that, I will go, uh, that I'm going to show, because obviously everything is anyway a small intensity coming out of the detector, as we are only dealing with a fraction of an electron that is ordering across, across the sample, so obviously it's not very strong per se. So uh, we have speckles, we have temperature variation of the average uh, peak, we wanted to learn more. How are the, um, uh, this, uh, how is the, the, so as we say, speckles come from the distribution of scattering center in the sample, call it domain, call it as you want. So how are those domains evolving versus time and versus temperature are the first two crucial uh, questions that you may ask yourself. And this is exactly what we analyzed. So we were able to show that those speckles do not move at all for hours. So everything looks extremely static if nothing is changing in the beamline. So if the source and photon propagation system is under control, the detector is under control, and the temperature and the condition of the sample are under control, everything is static for hours and hours. That also uh, tells that the quality of our beam and being able to stay stable for hours and hours. The problem of the real interesting parameter, obviously, is to change the temperature and see the evolution of the domains <clears> of <throat> the scattering center distribution, if you prefer, into the sample. The problem is that as soon as you change the temperature, obviously, the sample will move in the beam. There is no cryostat that stays stable, right, at the level required in a, in a coherent experiment that is submicrometric, essentially, control is needed. So CMP people came up with a beautiful idea of producing pinos, you see the array of pinos here, right? They're not very contrasted, but you can guess that there is a four by four array of pinos in this very thin lamina of uh, gold that is directly attached against the surface of the sample. So they are far enough that they cannot be, uh, they can be illuminated once uh, at the time, but they are small enough that they can be overfilled by our, our beam at the sample. Long story short, at the pain or at the price of realigning the sample and the specific pinot exactly at every single temperature, you can get the same illumination condition of your sample at any temperature. So here we report a small part of the detector, of our detect the signal on our detector, versus temperature as indicated on, on the top title of each uh, subplot. And you will see that uh, your eyes perfectly correlate what is happening, where there is a strong uh, signal or weak signal it's exactly, exactly staying, it's only the average or the parameter that attenuates, but not this, not, you, you cannot see any change in the distribution or spatial distribution on the, sun, on the detector of the speckles, right? Because if you look, or here the signal is almost gone, so let's go a little bit uh, uh, colder in temperature, let's say here, already quite close to the transition temperature of the charge density wave or the parameter fades away. You clearly see that where the signal is surviving is exactly coming from where the signal was stronger at the beginning, right? So it means that it's just an average attenuation, but nothing else. We can do better. We can do obviously cross correlation of images, right? So that we can get a quantitative value of how similar similar images are, and we can and and we and we get very high values indeed. We can do better. At that point, we, we got very interested and we say, wait a second. Now. Let's try to have the maximum signal available and let's try to warm up and cool down the sample and take a second image. So I always at 25 Kelvin, we took images. We took images at 25 Kelvin. We made the sample to go up in temperature, come back at 25 Kelvin and take another image. This is what is called before and after any of the temperature cycle that is reported here on top. And then you can compare the two images by cross correlation and you can get this value and you plot it versus temperature and you discover something quite magic. 
you measure always here that is inside the phase you say this is the order parameter that fades away at the uh, one of the structural transition by the way of the compound so we, we measure where the order is well formed is strong and you have a certain correlation this correlation is kept at any temperature you inspect you make the sample to inspect in the way i was describing before up to really high temperature way higher than anything that you may imagine co correlated or connected with the charge sensitive wave survives. And indeed, it changes only after having crossed a certain transition temperatures, temperature, which is related again to a structural transformation of the material. This is depicted in a time-wise way, so you have a certain speckle. You warm up the sample, you cool down at 25 again, you take another image, you see they are identical. You warm up a little bit more and you go closer to the transition, you come back, there is still some memory, but some details have changed. You cross well into the, into the new phase and you come back, you have no relation anymore from what you had before and what you have now. If you stay again below any of the temperatures here, you will get a new memory of a new state that it seems that you're written inside the sample only if you cross this transition temperature. That's the explanation. Please note that when I say speckles are correlated, so the cross correlation gives an I value, it means that you need to have the same distribution in terms of position, intensity, and phase out of your, of your sample. Otherwise, that would not be the case in terms of speckles of your detector. So it is really saying that there is something into the system that really encodes how the domains have to go back and they go back exactly in the same direction, in the same condition. So we came up with a, with a model that I tried to cartoon picture here. And we need to remember, because we have a fundamental problem, right? We have something that is exactly static in time and in temperature, but it's evolving in terms of average description, full width and maximum in particular, and or the parameter. How can we understand those two apparently opposite um, information? And we need to understand and we need to remember what the speckles mean. The speckle means the distribution in real in, is the reciprocal uh, is the Fourier transform of the distribution in real space of your scattering centers. So if you assume that the scattering centers are dense, this doesn't make sense, but it's not necessarily the case. It's sufficient to understand that they can be sparse and almost irrelevant in terms of volume, and then everything is clear. As depicted here in this simulation, as long as you keep your, uh, your scattering center and the correlated part of the signal that is coming out of the scatter, supposedly scattering center, <clears throat> into your sample, that's the Fourier transform that mimics the, the speckles that we detect on the detector, you see that if, uh, as long as they do not touch each other, essentially the speckles are the same, only when some of them start to touch each other, you start to see that it, some little differences indeed develop. As soon as they merge together, you have a completely different idea. So this means that it's sufficient to have only few sparse scattering centers that are dominating our signal here. And that's exactly a lot possible to allow for a complete evolution in terms of average for the parameter. And even full width and maximum in terms of the correlation briefing, no problem. That as long as this happens on a scale that is much further from the next point available in the real space of the sample, they can do what they want, no problem. The important thing is that they don't touch each other while evolving, right? And that told us immediately that the volume distribution have to have certain characteristics. And this is the cartoon picture that I used to, this, to explain why we can see this, this kind of temperature evolution. It means that there is a hidden order parameter that is written in the lattice that tells up to the distribution of the charge density wave how they, they, they come up into our material at low temperature and it stays written in spite of changing across this uh, first uh, structural transition. So if you go only here and you come back, they come back identical. If you go high enough, you change what is actually imprint, imprinting uh, here in the, in the intermediate state, how the, the, the charge density wave then have to condense and they condense in a different way. So here you have perfect reproducibility as long as you are in this part of the temperature correlation plot. And then you have a different situation because you change the underlying structure of the material across this transition here and you're here you end up being here okay this is a very special case and because everything is looks static in reality is it always the case not at all normally you can have a dynamic and that can give you much more information so how do you how do you obtain the dynamic information you have a detector that is acquiring images at a certain pace 
so that time and number of image equate. And you have speckles, for example, out of a real signal on our beam in the respective work the material was, and as much as much as it was before the case for the cuprates. You can do two things. Either you single out a line at your choice, vertical, horizontal, whatever you want, and then you just oppose all these lines that come from different images, such that you obtain a matrix that is pixel versus time or images, which is equivalent, and it's called a waterfall plot. And because if you do not have any dynamics, it looks like water falling from the sky to the bottom. Or you make, oops, sorry, or you single out an area and you calculate what is called the one-time correlation function, one time being the lag between the different images. So you see the expression, you take pixel by pixel <clears throat> the intensity and you correlate, cross-correlate, the intensity pixel by pixel in one image and in an image happening at a, at a, at a later time so that you, the only parameter you have is indeed the lag and you average over any initial condition, right? Again, if it is static, you expect a straight line at, at, at the value one, if g2 minus one will be seen a second one. If it is dynamic, the situation, you expect something completely different. You will have something wiggling somehow left and right here instead of being straight top to bottom. And you expect something that is relaxing down with a certain low, we will discuss it now, instead of being a straight line versus time, okay? So we have some uh, mathematical uh, tools and we can try to see if uh, this applied to other cases helps us. So just fresh out of the beam line, we have this uh, accepted paper in PRL from uh, always CMP in collaboration with CMP group on the equivalent structure that are instead of cuprates, nickelates. Why is this so interesting? Because nickelates have, have some difference, first of all, from the, from the basic um, point of view of the technique. Uh, charge order and space order are physically separated and are both accessible. So you can see selectively with the same technique to charge and spin <coughs> in the same sample in the same position, position that is once again constrained out of a deposited uh, pinot in a slightly different way this time. Um, it is fit on the sample somehow. And so uh, you, you, can get, you can get information, you have the charge and the spin order, you, we have again speckles, right? We have the average description and the, and the speckle description. We see that uh, they behave very differently in terms of correlation length, where the spin order is way uh, more correlated than the charge order. However, the dynamic information is also very different and opposite. So the one that is mostly correlated changes, the, changes its, uh, its uh, time dependence, so dynamical information, much more drastically than the one that is least correlated. So once again, it seems that the charge order has a memory of what is happening. The spin order can do more or less what it wants under certain conditions, but it's more free to evolve when the charge has to come back pretty much in the same condition. And again, we can make a speckle cross correlation as much as we did. And indeed we see that the charge order stays, for example, constant while the spin order evolves in a completely different way. We didn't go far, far enough to see that actually also the, speed, the charge order can change, but uh, there's, there's more, please uh, follow for the articles because it's, it's very rich in information. Let me just say that this is the intermediate fun uh, scattering function. And this is the reason why before I plot G2 minus one, because the left, the, what is the remaining part apart from the contrast of the speckle is indeed the evolution, the dynamical evolution of the order is contained in this parameter. Um, it was proved also on, on other relevant cases, like uh, the case of the magnetite with the electronic ordering across or around, I should say, the Faraday transition, where we clearly saw that at lower temperature, we have a more static, uh, static order, fine. Then you warm up and uh, the dynamics accelerate, but finally it slows down before making the transition to happen, which has a certain relevance with some uh, models, electronic models that, are, that, are, that, have, been, uh, that have been proposed. And also you can move to, um, uh, let's say, engineered structure, not only working in bulk or thin pins, real materials, but you can, you can go for uh, artificial spinizes, for example, and check the magnetic configuration in a square lattice as, as this one was the, the one chosen in this case. Well, you clearly see that working at very much more comfortable temperature in this case, because being, a, being engineered, you can do what, almost what you want out of it in terms of amount of materials, uh, symmetry topology, interaction by distance, and so on and so forth. So you can tune the sample really almost as you want. <clears throat> and you can have a transition temperature that is tuned around the ambient or even above, as it is, this was the case. And you see that you get a magnetic signal that going closer to the transition temperature develops defect in the order 
And indeed, you see speckles that are not present here and start to be present here due to the fact that you're visualizing the, the defects in the orb. This can be done over time, as I showed before, with a waterfall plot. And you see that if temperature is, is, is small enough compared to transition temperature, you have, you have some kind of defect, but then essentially the situation is static all the time. If you warm up, these defects are all, also have a dynamic because they, they bounce back and forth on multiple states, as it, has, it is evident, very evident, in the part that I, did, I, I zoomed in here, where evidently there is a kind of instability between some states. Obviously, this is known from other techniques like PIM, for example, that can access the direct and full field image over a large area with very high resolution, much higher than what we can do. But when it comes to dynamics, and then we, we, we can say probably something better, right? And also in correlation between images. It's very difficult to, to take a number, a very high number of images like this in PIM and then correlate everything to understand what are the small details on the movement of the, of the domains. Instead, here we get an average information, but it's very powerful because the Fourier transfer works for us. So I use the same, uh, the same uh, argument to show you that actually this, you see, is the lattice cell. And given that it's an, an anti-ferromagnetic uh, arrangement, in the center of the cell, you get the new, the new magnetic information. So you know by localization exactly what you look at. And then you can check polarization, you can check energy, you can check other things, obviously. And this is the same thing that I showed before with a little bit more uh, analysis in the, in the terms of what I showed you before as well. So the, the intermediate scattering function in the derivation that I was, uh, I was proposing. And you see that once again, you have an evolution of the average parameters in terms of all the parameters versus temperature that is the expected one, right? You have second transitions, second phase transition, it goes away, fluctuations or better correlations. So fluid width and maximum goes up, peak width, call it as you want, goes up. And everything works exactly as we saw in the in the coup rates, but we discovered that, that there was much more underneath. And here we, we have the impression that it's the same as well. Because if you make the fit out of the intermediate scattering function versus time, the initial part can give you the activation energy essentially, what you're looking at, which is a collective motion, domain motion, of the magnetic ordering into your sun. But if you look a little bit more attentively, you will see that there is a kind of oscillation everywhere, right? And, uh, uh, and so we have the impression that this comes exactly because there is some kind of repetitive, if not periodic, wiggling of the, of the magnetic domains in and out. <clears throat> and so we were wondering if this can, be, can, can tell us something more. And we are actively working on this with uh, some groups, in particular in, uh, in uh, Switzerland, uh, coming from PSI, Laura Heidelman, uh, Valerio Scagnoli, and uh, uh, now at uh, Columbia University. Uh, Sarah Scalvo. And uh, we need to be, however, you need, we need to make another step. It's not the, the one time for correlation function is not sufficient anymore because you average over all the initial conditions, as we said, as the only parameter of relevance is the distance, the time lag between uh, configurations. Instead, if you forget about this and you go to the two time correlation, you say, I don't care averaging about, about the initial state. I want to keep trace of this initial state corresponds after a certain, a certain time to this condition, that condition, that condition. And so you populate a matrix this time instead of a line plot. You will see indeed that there is some kind of periodicity, no, not periodicity, but a recurrence, let's say, in the correlation of the images, right? And it's, 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 quite, it's quite peculiar. As I said, it's all a work in progress, so I cannot talk too much about this, but it will have a relevance for what I'm sure I'm going to show you in one second, in a couple of slides. So what are we doing with this PCS here? So for what is allowed, obviously, on our scattering vectors, we are trying to extend, essentially, our domain of interest in terms of time energies, right? Obviously, over very small energy scales, so as I say, collective dynamics. But it's very interesting because we are limited one side detect by detector and flux, on the other of the st uh, by the stability of the beam, but we are effectively extending very, uh, very much this uh, area of interest, and it's very relevant because it's across, as I showed, fundamental phenomena of, of, uh, of interest that span across uh, various, uh, various opportunities, let's say. And we already are around ten, five orders of magnitude between 10 milliseconds, which is our detector uh, limitation at the moment, and several hours of the stability of our beam. So this is not the whole of the, of the richness that is allowed by coherence, because there is all the imaging part. We all know that seeing is so important for us human, right? I mean, any, any neural network that has a, a visual mean would, would uh, try to, 
to, to visual process everything uh, to, to the level we do. And also that is extremely difficult uh, if we put a very bunch, a very good bunch of, of scientists as depicted here in this cartoon, blind in front of a big, of a big problem. It's so easy to get, to get confused, right? So we have, we have many, many, uh, many uh, imaging uh, techniques already, already existent that are available, providing beautiful results, but every single one of them projects the reality in a specific direction due to technical constraints. So it is always good to have more and more techniques because adding a new slice on the problem can give us indeed new insight and just not to be confused. Mm? And so we tried our best to move in this direction and obviously learning from the image, very rich and important work uh, done by existing uh, imaging community, by, but by adding the resonant part, we are trying to make our, our uh, contribution. So starting easy, imaging by focusing. As I said, we have a Frenenson plate set up into the, into the, the chamber together with its water, sort and aperture. So we can make the illumination function to scan the sample fixed in space. It's already difficult enough to keep everything fixed at the level required. So we prefer to scan the illumination function compared to the sample. So we'll maybe comment a little more later. And we use this uh, neodymium nickel oxide uh, thin film across its metal to insulation and antiferromagnetic transition to check one of the family of the domains, one quarter, one quarter, one quarter reflection <coughs> available inside our evil sphere at nickel uh, L3 uh, energy. And to check how, it, how they evolve and what are the statistical parameters and how they are distributed versus temperature and versus cycle. This was done in collaboration, very fruitful collaboration that is still continuing with uh, Ricardo uh, Coming Group and Eric Carson in Puto. And you can see that uh, if you consider some of the, uh, some of the statistical uh, parameters and their distribution, you will discover that they are distributed uh, along some power laws, that they follow some specific uh, uh, cyclicity or not compared to, to the thermal cycle that you apply. And so you can get really an insight, quite, quite interesting, over orders of magnitude of distribution into your, of, your, of the magnetic domains or a subfamily of your magnetic domains into your sample. So we can also reconstruct, obviously, and the sa same or similar kind of information can come from the direct reconstruction using the Fourier inversion <clears throat> out, of, uh, out of the coherent images that are formed through speckles at the detector. And apart for a uh, nice, uh, let's say, test case, uh, just to prove that you have submicron resolution, you can, actually, you can actually detect structural and magnetic uh, relevant information across your sample, even when it's covered by, partially covered by a gold slab that is used as a reference, just to have a sharp corner or things like that. But it's only partially transferred, partially attenuating the signal. So you can even see that you're able to, to uh, reconstruct all that under that. And so to check that the presence of a metal close to the surface does not perturb what it does in a specific way, the ordering you are, you are considering. And um, this was an early effort of the so-called RECONS team that is uh, catalyzed around our beamline, our beamline effort, and there's participation from Los Alamos, MIT, and at the beginning, University of Marseille as well. So we are works, this is all still a work in progress, so I, I don't want to, to, to show too much because it's not published. What is instead published is that <clears throat> out of an experiment that we did with the Valerie Skiriukin group from uh, Utah, uh, Rutgers University, we noticed that apart from the very strong signal that is here coming from the center of our detector and it's hidden by our beam stop and this white line and white dot here, all the field that is hitting our, our uh, sample out of our pinot, in this case we use the pinot, can actually bring relevant information. So this is a, this is a specific sample kept below its uh, magnetic transition temperature on the magnetic propagation vector. And you see very well that if you cycle the temperature and you come back at the same, at the same temperature, as much as we did before, right? Always the same recipe. You see that there are specific uh, defects, structural defect here marked with the blue arrow that are static in the image, they don't move. And you have wiggling things going around, right? That instead they are rearranged each time that you go back into the magnetic phase. So evidently those and we proved by, by uh, calculations and simulation, those are uh, magnetic boundaries, anti-ferromagnetic boundaries that can be visualized directly in full field through the coherence of our beam. And this is essentially a complete prima 
right? There are not so many techniques around that can actually visualize already antiferromagnetic uh, domains, nor their borders so so clearly and uh, and uh, with uh, with such an ease. And this brought the, the ability of, of, of looking at, at uh, arrangement of antiferromagnetic uh, domains in, in system with uh, with a great uh, with great level of details. Now we have two things that we can say why this is why this is interesting and which are the limitations that we have. So let me start from the limitation because <clears throat> it will unchain immediately another another discussion. I'm seeing that I'm going a little long, but I will try to come back. So. Space or time, the typical experimental uh, dilemma. Signal is never enough, right? And we try to blind average to increase statistic. This is perfect if everything is static, because you are sure that you are adding apples to apples and uh, increasing the signal to noise by averaging. But if it is, is not the case, so the signal is not static, you incur in the problem that actually the average that you are doing with your data is only saving the part that is static or pseudo-static out of your signal and you're losing everything else. Ideally, we would love to have an instantaneous knowledge of the states that our system is populating. And for doing this, we should be able to do a selective average that says, now I'm dealing with apples, I will put in the apple basket. Oh, now the system has transformed to strawberries, and so we put those data in the strawberry basket, and so on and so forth. The problem is how to do it, obviously. So <clears throat> why is this relevant? But it is relevant because actually, there are a number of uh, scientific cases and applications that depend on the fact that we can know how the system is evolving, is making the phase transformation to happen, and it's actually dealing with its own, uh, let's say, excitation, local excitations, in terms of domain walls, uh, uh, magnetic structures, uh, local structures, bubble domains, scalings, whatever you want to call them, or whatever you want to think about. And there are a number of publications that have shown that we can actually use those kind of, uh, uh, those kind of uh, uh, topological excitation, if you want to call them like that. <clears throat> to either encode information or even process uh, data, so making uh, calculations to happen, or simulate classical or quantum system, even with artificial spinances, for example. So to move in that direction, we, we, again, we started easy, because <laughs> there are enough difficulties already not tracked, that, so that it's, it's a good idea to try to keep your life as easy as possible, and we went straight down to, the, uh, to add a new end station at the very end of our beam, the one that I showed you before, dedicated to holography. So in collaboration with the MIT group of uh, Professor Jeffrey Bridge, um, uh, Beach, sorry, we, uh, uh, we used a, a perpendicular magnetization multilayer containing essentially a thermal film, and, and we um, uh, using, uh, exploiting the, the, uh, the knowledge of our uh, German uh, collaborators, uh, we produce masks for holography with an all of control dimension exposing the, uh, the sample and a couple of references all going through everything of fixed, of fixed uh, uh, and very controlled diameter, such that using this MCD, because we have a perpendicular magnetization in the field, and the holography set up, as I said, and using our coherent beam, we can get beautiful, uh, beautiful images that can be inverted as an holography, an holography image can, can be, given that you propagate the information, on that, so it is very relevant. Also because it can extract smaller signal out of the out of the of the background, so it is really really relevant. And also understand if the if the contrast that you have is enough to explain a static situation, if there is a partial dynamic uh, dynamic uh, component that is out of your of your detection window window, right? Like in terms of too fast for your detector to be seen. As I was saying, the average the blind average essentially is done on the sample instead of on your data. And then use better what is available because we proved that already there were available tools, but projected in a new uh, in a new way can give new information. So this depicts the case of understanding how the uh, relevant charge density wave is distributed inside some samples. Then there is the connectivity diagram that I showed before and so on. Let me stress last the importance of uh, simulations as we're doing with uh, Oleg and this very powerful SLW uh, program that is available for everybody and that's the link and conclusions of the conclusions coherent offers fantastic opportunities it comes at some price and in particular some attention has to be has to be put new techniques are some of which are under development and new perspectives are offered detector and photon uh, birth to death simulation are very important beam stability is fundamental and with this i've finished thank you very much for your attention and apologies
if I was a little wrong. Thank you so much for this very rich and informative talk. Uh, so the, the, the session is open, open for questions. We have already Ian Robinson was the, asked to start. Please, Ian. Um, hello, everybody. Um, sorry, I missed the beginning of the, the talk because we have beam time in, in Grenoble and uh, uh, we, we were going through a training session. But um, um, but uh, I, I, I caught uh, some some of the, uh, uh, the second half. Um, Claudio, you, you raised the interesting possibility of doing XPCS in real space uh, and the idea that you could see the domains with holography and, the, and then uh, attempt to do sort of correlations uh, of, of those domains uh, in, in real space. Um, I'm wondering if, if that ever works for real sort of genuine fluctuations such as the um, the LBCO that you also talked about. Um, uh, would, would you think it's still appropriate to use the idea of a, of a G2 function or a two-time correlation function? And uh, second half of the question, do you think that that would be, uh, do you think the decays would still be exponential uh, for, the, for the fluctuations in real space? Hi, thank you very much for the question. So uh, it's, a, it's a quite uh, extensive one. Um, so I think that the, the, the reply to the first of your question is, yes, we have started to, to work on specific uh, cases, not only based on, uh, on holography, and uh, we know it works. We know that the G2 is pretty much the, the instrument we have at the moment, so we, the one that we applied, and it seems to work and uh, to give some, some results. Um, it is quite interesting, indeed, to revert back once you have the, the full, uh, uh, let's say, a two times correlation function to revert back to the first time to the one time correlation function and understand how good you are in the approximation of extracting, for example, exponents. Sometimes it works, sometimes not. And it's exactly what I was trying to relate somehow in a very quick and dirty way, I agree. But with the ergodic approximation, right? Sometimes you, your system, given all the boundaries conditions that you are, you are using, temperature, uh, speed at which you, you, can, you can acquire the, system, the signal and so on and so forth. It's indeed a, in a good approximation for the extent of time that you, that you, you can grant to your, to your measurement. It is in a good, uh, in a good approximation of, uh, if you want ergodic, so you can extract some relevant exponents. Sometimes it's not at all. And so that's also the reason why G2, uh, so let's say the two times correlation analysis is always advised, just to try to understand if what you want to extract out of the one time as a meaning, or you are over-interpreting the data or stretching essentially the conclusions. Yes. Karina uh, Tonell, please. Uh, hi. Uh, hi, Claudio. Very, very nice talk. Um, we are from the, the Softimax Beamline, so there's a couple of my colleagues also I saw. Um, and we are basically uh, your equivalent here at, uh, at Max4. Uh, we are not as far ahead as you are in terms of the scattering, so uh, very impressive. And a couple of practical questions, maybe. So you mentioned uh, to speed up the, the detector, and obviously in the soft X-ray regime, uh, there's not a big choice in fast detectors. Uh, is there anything that you have uh, that you know is ongoing towards faster detectors? And if so, how fast would you like it? Uh, no, I don't know a lot. Uh, I know that uh, there is a change in technology that is supposed to give uh, some benefits, let's say, uh, at the price of some other uh, problems. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's not, uh, it's, it's just becoming available now. There are several producers, there are several vendors that are working on this. But you are absolutely right that our, our field is such a niche and there is no essentially or very limited investment, unfortunately, in this direction. Uh, what I would love to see, obviously, is a higher energy resolution of the detectors, even polarization sensitivity of the detector. That would be fantastic. These are all dreams because there is absolutely essentially no investment and no, no possibility that I know of in this direction, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. So we are at the window as much as you are <laughs> and uh, hoping for somebody to come up with good ideas. And in the meantime, we are doing our best to try to, yeah, to do what we can at the price of photons as always. <laughs> yeah. 
And and regarding the stability uh, yes. that you mentioned, so I mean that that obviously is also linked to to uh, uh, to the time resolution, I, I would imagine, for instance. So how how is that at your beam line? Is there uh, any specific uh, improvements that you had to make in order to to get it working, or that was that was not an issue at these speeds? Can I ask you to detail a little better on what you meant by implying uh, time resolution and so on? Because uh, this this uh, is maybe something I didn't understand exactly. Um, I was thinking it's kind of like because the detectors are relatively compared to hard X-ray, they're relatively slow. Um, right. So is the time time resolution of the detector somehow linked to the stability required? at the beamline or is there other things at the beamline just sort of like, you know, uh, random hops on a very slow time scale? I see. That's, that's so, now that's a very relevant question indeed, you're right. It, it, let's say that if, let me let me rephrase, maybe uh, it may answer, maybe then you will come. So if going faster means that you're losing control of the stability of the detector in, in whatever sense we can, we can think about, then you're right, that is, that is a very big constraint and we, we should think very carefully about because the, the, the stability, what I call stability, I think about longer time scale, right? So the opposite uh, uh, mm -hmm. end of the spectrum, if you prefer. That is, that is the integral of all the properties from source to photon delivery system to uh, detector, provided mm -hmm. the sample is a little bit uh, special, right? Because it contains extrinsic and, intri and intrinsic parts. So the, the extrinsic parts of the sample have, have also entered that part of the equation. If everything there is set correctly and under control, you can hopefully get some information out of the intrinsic part of the sample. This is what I try to, to explain and meant in my, in my study. So you're absolutely right that if, if going faster with the detector compromises the stability and affects the long part uh, that, you, that, you are, that you are going to check, so yes, it can in principle, and we have to be very attentive about it. Let's say that we are in a little bit of an happy spot where we have a very fast detector, one of the fastest available, if not the fastest available on the market. And we are somehow able to manage everything such that it, it, we also get stability over hours complexly in, in good days. And don't get me wrong, it's not always the case. Uh, mm. As you're an experimentalist as I am, so <laughs> we know perfectly, right? But, if the uh, planets are aligned, let's say we can get up to hours of stability on the beam, and uh, that's that's uh, good news. So yes, yeah, I hope I, I, I reply. Exactly, and a very small question: the spot size on the sample. What kind of uh, sizes do you use on average? So the, the end station was designed uh, when NSLS was still uh, uh, available and the only source on site at BNL by Janine and Stuart Wilkins in a very clever way. And one of the characteristics was to be able to change a lot the illumination function on the sample. Mm -hmm. And uh, so by changing the setup that is available, but they are all available and it's just a matter of introducing them in the, in the propagation pattern or removing them, we can essentially span from fraction of millimeter down to 100 nanometers. So depending if you use a far pin or a close pin or, or zone plate setup, mm -hmm. you can, you can Let's say with overlap, you can you can you can change the illumination function of your sample. Obviously, you always stay in terms of flux and other things, but essentially we have this this uh, this ability, which has come extremely handy indeed. Because sometimes you characterize your sample first in one condition, then you know you have a lot of signal. It's very easy to navigate. You know exactly where to go, and then you start to cut down right and and hammer exactly in the direction that is allowed by the setups mm -hmm. in terms of flux, intensity, stability, coherence, uh, and, and, and the cross of all, of all these parameters. Mm -hmm.